Hi, I am Mux. Uh, I run a company that makes uh, extender batteries for cars, so range extending batteries that you put in the rear of your car. A common question that gets asked to me and lately gets asked a little bit more is why do you do batteries and not hydrogen? Uh, because of course hydrogen and fuel cells are the fuel of the future. Um, so it only seems logical that innovative companies like ours uh, would invest in that kind of pathway. I'm not completely convinced. And uh, as a quick disclaimer, uh, so I've written a couple of blogs about this uh, in the far, far ago, uh, around 2015, uh, about essentially the non-viability of hydrogen fuel cells in vehicles. Uh, and a lot of those conclusions back then still apply, but there is a big but. Uh, there's a new hydrogen hype cycle uh, going on. So every 10 years or so, it seems like hydrogen gets the limelight again. Uh, so it was around the early 2000s. Uh, then the sort of early 2010s, 2013, 2014 or something. And now again, uh, there is a, again a big interest from people, even people I know, even colleagues of mine who have asked me like, uh, why don't you try developing a hydrogen fuel cell solution instead of a battery extender? So this is actually a good question. I have worked on hydrogen fuel cells before. Uh, back in 2007, like between the two hype cycles, uh, I was involved in a hydrogen fuel cell kart racing team uh, called Formula Zero Team Delft, later we ran to Forza. Um, and we made a hydrogen powered kart that used a hydrogenics uh, fuel cell stack. And uh, we were very successful with that, with that cart. Uh, we made a working hydrogen fuel cell cart. Uh, it was pretty cool. And um, after that, uh, I was involved with the team between 2007 and 2009. Uh, and directly afterwards, I've even done some consulting for fuel cell companies uh, and some related stuff. Uh, but then, for some reason, I slowly started veering towards batteries. So I would like to take this opportunity of my expertise over the past 15 years or so, uh, combined with the expertise in my company, to show um, how a battery-based uh, range extender would compare to a fuel cell-based range extender. So let's actually try designing one. So let's begin this, shall we? Um, we're going to do a direct comparison of a battery-based, so a battery range extender, hydrogen fuel cell range extender. Now, for this example, we are uh, basically going to use the, so let's begin with the beginning, right? We've got our nice car, it is going to be a very ugly Nissan Leaf which is saying something. So what happens is uh, an electric car, uh, it's got a big battery usually in between the wheels. Uh, and in the case of the Nissan Leaf, uh, that is a between 24 and 62 kilowatt hour battery, right? Uh, that will get you uh, between uh, 80 and uh, 200 miles, roughly, uh, of actual range. So that will translate to about uh, 140 to uh, 325 ish kilometers, I think. It's rough. I, I would actually call it 120 on the low end. These batteries, they are at around 400 volts. So, in lithium ion terms, that's uh, 96 series cells, lithium ion cells. Um, and then what we do is we put a big battery in the back. And this, this, is, this is very similar uh, for other cars as well. Uh, the amount of boot space basically limits how many batteries you can fit. Uh, we can fit uh, between 11 and 33 kilowatt hours. Uh, that will add about uh, like uh, 40 to, what's this in miles? 120 miles or something. I'm sorry, I have to do on the fly conversion. And again, this is also a 400 volt 96s system. All right, so that's the extender battery. Now, why is it here and not somewhere else? Well, very simple. There is no space in the car. Um, there is this uh, concept of the uh, the protected cage. 
So very roughly drawn. This is where the passengers are. There's the front seat and there's the rear seat. Wow. Rear seat is more like here. Front seat is probably more like here. Uh, and then there's the football and everything. Everything within here is uh, is protected, right? So this this is this is a place that is uh, sacred. Uh, I want to fill this. It is sacred, therefore it is red. This is somewhere we cannot put anything. Now, obviously, the front of the car, the nose of the car, is basically chock full uh, with other stuff, with your motor, your charger, uh, all kinds of electronics. Uh, underneath the car is the battery already, then at the front underneath technically there is some space. Rear uh, underneath the car there is also generally a little bit of space, but uh, all things considered uh, the, the only real contiguous good space that you have in the car is in the boot. Um, so that's, that's where you put the battery. Uh, the same thing will go for a hydrogen fuel cell ranging center. So realistically uh, what you have, you have between 100 and 300 liters uh, so that's, oh my god, what's that in gallons? That is like 25 to 75 gallons, uh, realistically, a space that you can use. And uh, the higher end of that is unreasonable, I would say. I, I, I would strive for about 100, 150 liters of actual um, uh, space used. So that's, uh, that's the restrictions we're working on, right? Now, because we're going for the fuel cell range extender, uh, it's also quite important to know how much power the car is using. And this is maybe a little bit of a confusing thing because there's this 80 kilowatt or a newer uh, car is 110 or even 150 kilowatt motor in front. Uh, even in, in very high power situations, like you're driving with a headwind, driving quite fast, um, typically uh, you're between 10 and 20 kilowatts of actual power use at any moment. And that includes heating. So uh, at the low end, like the, the very least you're targeting, I, I would say 20 kilowatts is too, too little for a range extender. Uh, because that would mean that uh, in order to keep up, so what the range extender would do is uh, it would. So what the range extender really should do is keep up with the loss of your main battery power, uh, so that it can basically charge your battery while it is uh, being depleted by your driving, and realistically. Uh, if you're only supplying about 10 kilowatts of power, um, you would have to, with the 24 kilowatt hour battery, which only really has about 21 kilowatt hours of net capacity, uh, you would have to drive for two hours uh, before you empty it out, so have an average speed of about 60 kilometers an hour to continuously maintain, like that's, that's the absolute edge of your performance where you can keep up, and realistically that's, that's not going to happen. So uh, I would say you want to shoot for the higher end of this power range, at least 15 kilowatts. So let's just say we uh, shoot for uh, 15 kilowatts of nominal power here. So we've got a capacity, um, we've got a power, we know it's got to be 400 volts, so let's start uh, designing our system, right? So for the battery range extender, this is your main component. So uh, for clarity, I'm I'm just putting all your all the necessary components of this uh, this range extender into this box, uh, so we can figure out what things should cost and how large it is and all that kind of stuff. The battery box. Things like a fuse and contactors. So when the car is off, um, regulations say that all the high voltage has to stay within this battery box. There cannot be anything outside of the battery uh, that, that carries high voltage. So inside the battery, uh, and again, also inside our battery box for the extender, 
there are contactors. Contactors are really big relays that shut off power to the outside. So everything stays nice and inside the safe box. The fuse is uh, sort of optional. Um, uh, depends a lot on the actual battery design, uh, but I'll, I'll keep it in here. And then of course, uh, there's the battery management system, thermal management system as well. So Nissan thinks the thermal management system and to some extent the battery management system is optional. Uh, yes, that is a dig at Nissan. Thermal management system, uh, batteries don't like to be cold. Batteries don't like to be really hot. You want to keep them kind of in the middle. So if it's freezing outside, you want to heat them up. Uh, and if it is really uh, hot outside or when you're doing lots of fast charging sessions after each other, um, then you want to cool them down, right? So you need some, some kind of thermal management system as well. Um, that's a fairly big, big cost factor as well. And uh, so for clarity, the Nissan LEAF itself doesn't have a thermal management system in their main batteries. So when you charge them, uh, fast charge them a couple times in a row, uh, they overheat, which is fun. Uh, it doesn't mean they actually break. Uh, they just start charging much more slowly. Uh, some electronics, this is, uh, uh, we use something called a man in the middle board uh, and some wiring looms to break into the cabling of the car and uh, make sure that the car recognizes the extender battery uh, and its capacity and everything that has to do with that. So, uh, however, this is, this is a really small part of the cost of the, uh, of the car. So now we go for batteries. Um, so typically the current uh, state of industry batteries is that you can get them for about 150 to 200 dollars per kilowatt hour in in the types of volumes that we can purchase right um so 150 is kind of the low end for uh uh for relatively low performance low cycle life uh batteries things like uh, lithium iron phosphate batteries and then on the high end, you get the really high performance, the 5C uh, batteries with, with excellent internal resistance and pouch cells and all that kind of stuff. Typically, you get about, well, 350 to 400 watt hours per liter. And typically you get about 210 to 230 uh, watt hours per kilogram. Uh, typically you can uh, discharge them at two to three C and charge them at uh, 1 to 3C. And this means that if we take our 11 or, uh, uh, well, actually we're going to just go for the 33 kilowatt hour uh, example because that skills best. Uh, so the 33 kilowatt hour is able to uh, source uh, about 99 kilowatts of power and uh, it can charge at at least 33 kilowatts. Uh, there, there, I mean, it's, when it's completely empty, it will charge a little bit slower, but uh, we, we don't care too much about the tiny nuances there. So as far as cost goes, well, that's like $5,000, right? $5,000. Um, oh, not just that. Uh, it's 350 to 400 watt hours per liter. Now let's say that the batteries take up the bulk of your extender, but there's some other stuff as well. Uh, so let's just say 300 watt hours per liter. So it's about 100 liters altogether. Um, and then as far as the weight goes, uh, 210 to 230 watt hours per kilogram. Let's say the rest of the stuff also has some weight. So you'll end up at about 150, 160 kilograms, right? So enclosure uh, materials, usually battery boxes are made from steel, either stainless or powder coated. And there's these places like 24 seven Taylor steel that will make a folded box for you. Uh, and all you need to do is weld the seams and you've got a very nice battery box, 200 to $300. But we have, we want the enclosure to fit nicely in the car and cars don't have really regular shapes. It's all curves and everything. Um, so what we really use is a, a glass fiber laminate it for 300 to $500. Let's, let's call it $500, right? 
Now, battery management systems. Uh, again, let's uh, start talking here. Uh, an automotive grade battery management system is typically going to run you between two and five dollars per cell. Uh, the 33 kilowatt hour battery that we do, uh, it's got 96 cells in series, so theoretically uh, that's about 200 to 500 dollars for the BMS. Now we make our own in-house BMS and it's actually a bit cheaper uh, but the BMS, uh, let's, let's just call it 500 bucks, right? Uh, altogether, including everything, including cabling, uh, $500. If you can get a $500 BMS for a 96S pack, I think you're doing really well uh, in the open market. And then a thermal management system. So uh, you need to heat it up, you need to cool it down. So you're gonna need a heat pump. And very simply put, any kind of heat pump solution is going to cost about a thousand dollars. There's this uh, uh, Chinese market for heat pump components and even just a 400 volt scroll compressor uh, with uh, with a drive uh, that can work from 400 volts. Uh, that's something like six hundred dollars uh, for one that can remove the amount of heat. So, uh, for clarity, let's let's just go through that calculation as well. If you have uh, a 33 kilowatt hour battery, typically your internal resistance during um, during charging for our uh, battery is about 0.15 to 0.2 ohms. If we're going to design this for CCS in the future, and I would like this to charge as fast as possible, we want to compete with the hydrogen fuel cell range extender, right? Uh, it should be charging at 3C. So it will will charge at uh, 33 kilowatt hours is 90 amp hours so times 3 that is let's say 250 amps uh, 0.15 times 250 times 250 that is about um, so the worst worst case here um, that's about 9 kilowatts thermal that we have to remove. Uh, fast charging, heat buildup in your battery, that's going to be the absolute uh, highest amount of heat you'll ever need to remove from the battery. Just normal use of the car, discharging it is way easier on the battery than fast charging. So this is going to be our worst case scenario, nine kilowatts thermal. Uh, and if you uh, kind of size your uh, thermal management system on that, you're gonna run uh, the, the costs are going to be at least a thousand dollars. So what we actually do uh, in our uh, battery is the thermal management system is optional. Uh, if you want to upgrade later to the CCS fast charging, then we will highly recommend uh, getting a thermal management system for the battery. But if all you do is charge at much lower speeds, like if you're only charging at uh, uh, two demo stations, the battery will never see more than about 50 amps. Uh, and that, uh, that means it's a five times lower uh, current, and that means it's a 25 times lower uh, amount of heat. So uh, nine kilowatts divided by 25, that's um, 360 watts or something. Uh, that's nothing. That is so little that you barely need any cooling at all. Uh, so it's really only for the really extreme charging speeds that you need this uh, this thermal management system, or at least in our case. Uh, of course, for uh, cold weather, you do still need the heating, uh, but that heater pads are very cheap. It's a few dollars compared to a thousand dollars for uh, for a heat pump. Now then, um, the fuse and contactors. I'll, I'm just gonna. Put that in that's about 150 that's not much at all 200 bucks so without the tms we're going to be about 6500 bucks 7500 with the thermal management system uh it's going to be about 100 liters it's going to be about 100 let's say 160 kilograms if you have the tms uh, that's actually quite a heavy thing it's going to be 170 kilograms to be clear, 33 kilowatt hour range extender on these older cars is excellent uh, as far as capacity goes. It means that the, the car with the, like the original, especially like a 24 kilowatt hour leaf, 
uh, that can only do 80 miles and 80 miles in good weather uh, you'll transform it into a 200 mile car that really feels like a little bit more than that even uh, uh, just because of the, the type of car you came from right all right so let's um, let's take a look at a hydrogen fuel cell system so because most people are not nearly as familiar with hydrogen fuel cells as they are with um, batteries, I will just very quickly, schematically draw a um, fuel cell system. We've got a tank, um, the hydrogen tanks, uh, they are filled with hydrogen gas under a high pressure, 700 bar, so that's 700 times the normal pressure in the atmosphere. Um, it sounds really high, but there's people that say that they don't want to sit on a super high high pressure uh, pressure vessel. This, it's really not that bad an issue. Uh, these, these tanks, they don't just like break and release all pressure at once. Uh, even in case of a really bad accident, they tend to just damage and vent. Uh, and of course, hydrogen is super flammable on that. But like as an actual explosion hazard, it's, it's not, that, not that interesting, honestly. But um, this is a significant part of your system. Uh, I'm seeing that it's at 700 bars because um, of course that hydrogen has to be inserted into a fuel cell stack. So fuel cells very much like battery cells. Uh, a fuel cell has a typical voltage of uh, something like 0 0.6, uh, now it's a 1.2-ish volt, right? Uh, so you need to uh, put many of them in series. You have to make a stack of many cells. That's why they're called uh, fuel cell stack. And uh, the typical working pressure is uh, about 1.5 to 3 bars. Um, the hydrogen at about 50%, or the hydrogen and the oxygen at about 50% relative humidity. So in practice, um, you need quite a lot of stuff. This is Typically these days, this is a very integrated device. Um, it reduces the pressure of your uh, hydrogen from 700 bars to something like 10 or 15. Um, and it's also got things like a anti-backlash stuff. So if, if high pressure enters from the other side, it will go shut. And in case of all kinds of failures, like uh, if there are suddenly very high gas flow through it, uh, much higher than you would expect uh, from the uh, uh, the consumption of the fuel cell, then obviously it seems like there's a leak, so it also automatically shuts off. There's all kinds of safety features in these things now. Uh, back when we were uh, making the, uh, the cart, the hydrogen cart, uh, we had to do all these things separately. So it was quite a lot of pipe work um, to get the hydrogen safely from the tank to the fuel cell. These days, it's, uh, the, the hydrogen part is not that bad, honestly. Uh, so there's a um, humidifier, this will add some water vapor to your uh, incoming hydrogen. So there's, there's more stuff going on here. Honestly, I forgot half of it. From the high pressure to like an intermediate pressure where you do all the important stuff to the hydrogen. And then you finally reduce it down and this is also kind of a regulator, not just a reduction valve, but also a regulator valve. Uh, that makes sure that uh, your inflowing gas is tuned to the expected output power and that kind of stuff. Because you don't just need to insert hydrogen, you also need to insert oxygen. Uh, and you do that by introducing air. So there's a big fan. Then there is a scrubber. So very, very important to fuel cells is um, fuel cells are extremely sensitive to uh, what's called atmospheric poisons, things like carbon dioxide, or mostly carbon monoxide. Um, that's, a, uh, that's a gas that is present in the air in very small quantities um, that tends to stick to the, uh, to the fuel cells or in the, in the proton exchange membrane, and it tends to stick to the catalyst. Uh, and when it sticks, it stays there, so it reduces the ability of your fuel cell to perform. Um, and you need really pure hydrogen, really pure air 
uh, to go into it. O obviously, air is mostly uh, oxygen. Well, it's mostly nitrogen and then oxygen and then other stuff. But yeah, you need to get rid of most of the other stuff. Uh, uh, then here too, there's a humidifier. So again, uh, hydrogen fuel cells, they work at exactly 60 degrees. They don't like to be uh, lower than about 50. They definitely don't want to go higher than 70. So you need to preheat your reagents. Uh, means that we also need a heater. So what happens if, um, if you release a really, really high pressure gas uh, from a tank to a lower pressure? Because of the ideal gas law, you lower the pressure and that means that the uh, gas will become extremely cold. It will easily attract moisture from the air, condense it, and then freeze it onto the pipes. Uh, so that is an unwanted source of, um, uh, of moisture in your entire system. Um, but also um, the, the cold gas uh, will not react well in your fuel cell. So you have to preheat it. Now, fuel cells are quite inefficient machines. Uh, they create a lot of heat by themselves. So generally this heater, there is a heating element in there, uh, but it's only for startup. Uh, after the fuel cell starts working well, uh, both the heater for the air and the heater for the uh, for the hydrogen, uh, that will just be some some recirculating coolant from the fuel cell stack itself. We got our power output, and you need a DC to DC converter. So fuel cell stacks, um, uh, they're typically around 40 volts, uh, something like 24 to 36 cells uh, is quite common. Um, there's there's many reasons for this. There's packaging. There's the one that we used for the team was a Hydrogen's High PM8, and I think it was something like. 80 volts? Yeah, so, something like that. But also, like, um, a fuel cell doesn't give a constant voltage, not, not nearly. Um, when it's doing almost nothing, the voltage is much higher than when it's um, outputting full power. So you need a DC to DC. And then the output is going to be about 320 to 400 volts. In a normal vehicle, if, if this is all you have, this is not going to work. These fuel cells take some time to ramp up and down. When you press the accelerator, uh, you kind of want the car to move, right? Um, and the typical ramp up and ramp down time uh, of fuel cells in, in the order of seconds. Uh, way too slow to actually react immediately to user inputs. Uh, so you typically do have a battery here, uh, just a buffer battery. It's not large. Uh, so for most fuel cell uh, vehicles, it's between it's it's in uh, in the single digits to very very low double digits um, uh, capacity. So I've seen um, an 11 kilowatt hour battery used for a bus for a range extender application. We don't need this uh, because we already already have the battery, right? We have the main battery in the car. This here, this does everything we need. So that battery is something uh, we, we don't need to include. There's quite a lot here. I'm, I'm going to gloss over some uh, some things. Because there's one thing missing here, and that is uh, this part in our battery, the thermal management system. So if we have this fuel cell stack and we say it is a 15, oh, sorry again. We say that this is a 15 kilowatts electric now, fuel cells are about 60% efficient. Um, and that means we will have about 10 kilowatts of thermal to remove as well. Uh, this is not a worst case uh, scenario. This is what we continuously need to remove. And it's going to be actually a little bit more, something sort of like 12 to 15 kilowatts thermal. Uh, when it's working at the absolute uh, highest power. Also, DC to DC converter is going to have some losses, but uh, mostly it's the, the fuel cell stack itself. Uh, some of that thermal energy is going to go into the heaters, but really mm, almost all of it uh, will have to be removed. So you need quite a large uh, radiator and fan. Here we go. This is what we need to do. So as with the batteries, some of you might have noted that these batteries I'm costing them at 150 to 200 dollars per kilowatt hour. If you actually, if you keep up with the news about batteries, you will know that batteries are very close to 100 dollars per kilowatt hour. But only if you're a really large 
battery buyer and even then it's just the cells you don't get the modules you don't get everything that that belongs to it uh, to be able to get to good battery pricing you need to buy humongous amounts and buy them very far in advance uh, and unfortunately that is not something that we can do as Muxan. That's not something you can do if you're by, uh, building a hydrogen fuel cell range. That means that a lot of the prices here are going to be somewhat disappointing uh, if you stack the theory against the, the reality. So um, I know from, uh, from my uh, industry knowledge basically that uh, fuel cell stack costs they hover at around $500 per kilowatt these days. Uh, that's basically what you can buy a fuel cell for. Now, to be clear, this is incredibly low compared to what it was. We, uh, with the team, we um, bought a, well, we didn't buy, we got gifted a Hydrogenix IPM8. That's an eight kilowatt continuous fuel cell stack got gifted to us for the value of 155,000. Well, it's not even dollars, it was euros. Apparently there's no euro sign in this font. Well, whatever. Uh, let's just call it 170K. $20,000 per kilowatt or something? Uh, like like an absolute, absolutely ridiculous thing. That's, that's 2007, 2008, by the way. Uh, yeah, that's what, what fuel cells used to cost back then. Uh, these days, it is so much lower. It is so much better than it was. So yeah, uh, five hundred dollars per kilowatt, pretty good pricing. Um, so for a, a fifteen kilowatt version, you would be paying seventy five hundred bucks. Now the tank. How large should the tank be? Realistically, we should probably aim for a tank. So thirty three kilowatt hours. Uh, thirty three kilowatt hours would be about so uh, hydrogen. It's about 33 kilowatt hours per kilogram of embodied energy, but uh, because the fuel cell stack can only get 60% out, it's really um, 20 kilowatt hours per kilogram. So you need about a uh, 1.5 kilogram tank. But uh, really important to know is that these tanks, they're not allowed to be spent fully. You can have fully discharge them. Uh, because if there's no pressure on it and then you repressurize it to 700 bars uh, the material it will it will cycle so much it will have so much strain variation through its uh, cycling um, that it will have a much reduced uh, lifetime so really what you want that's also something that the that that valve safety system thing uh, does it will limit discharging the tank to something like 100 or 150 bars uh, which, by the way, is usually like the maximum pressure you get on other tanks, like steel tanks, but whatever. Uh, so really, this is going to be a two kilogram tank. All right, so if you want to buy a hydrogen tank, the specs you usually get are the mass fraction of hydrogen you can put in them. And typically, uh, for the cheaper tanks, so for something we would consider uh, for this range extender, uh, you will get about a six to seven percent mass fraction. Um, so if we, if you just take the worst case of that, so for two kilograms, uh, divided by 0.06, that will be a 33 kilogram tank. Now the same goes for volume. So it's at 700 bars, two kilograms is that's a thousand moles, right? Uh, so at SCP. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this tank will be about 100 liters. That's about what you can can get. I have to reiterate, this is not the best you can get in the industry. This is the best uh, you can get for like a decent price. Uh, there are about $20 a liter uh, per liter of actual tank volume. Um, so you would expect this tank uh, to sell for about $2,000. Now the piping and this valve and uh, the reducing stuff. So to be clear, you cannot just use any pipes. Um, you have to use a special grade of stainless steel uh, that can deal with hydrogen because hydrogen is a really pernicious molecule. 
uh, it basically leaks through everything and you're only allowed a certain amount of leakage in your entire hydrogen system. There are, there are good regulations on exactly how you um, how you do hydrogen stuff in cars. So I will I will very generously call this 500 bucks. To be clear, I don't actually know exactly what these things cost. Um, I know them from Sigma Aldrich. So that's a um, chemical supplier. Uh, I've tried ordering hydrogen stuff with them very long ago. And they have they have this stuff, but it's all lab grade. So it's I think it's way more expensive than it should be. Uh, it, it, this would have been thousands and thousands of dollars if we uh, would have bought all these things. I think um, if if you go uh, go to NetStack or some other company that deals with this stuff, uh, you can get it for 500 bucks. Now the humidifier, uh, I've broken them out because this is probably uh, one of the most expensive parts of the entire deal. Uh, it's a rather complex thing, especially on the hydrogen side, because uh, it has to inject Wire into the hydrogen stream without leaking hydrogen everywhere. Uh, so I mean that too. I'm going to be honest. Uh, this is all the theoretical column. I don't know the actual prices for this, but I know that $500 is probably a really, really low estimate. All right, the scrubber. Um, it's a uh, typically the scrubbers uh, are kind of uh, higher quality carbon. You can use like HEPA carbon stuff, and I think you will get fine air quality out of that. So honestly, if you if you go and make a thousand of these, maybe you can you can do it for less than two hundred. Let's let's just be super generous and call it a hundred bucks. All right, DC to DC conversion. Uh, step down. DC to DC converters are inching ever closer uh, to a to. 10 cents per watt. Step up like this. For some reason, uh, I'm, I'm in this field. I know how to design this stuff. Uh, for some reason, it's more expensive uh, by a lot. If we want a uh, 15 kilowatt DC to DC converter, this is going to run you about three grand. Radiator fan combo, and then also like the pump and piping and everything that uh, that goes with that. Uh, so, so typically, radiators, radiator fan combos, uh, they start at around a uh, hundred dollars kilowatt at the low low end. So at low power, and then they go down to something like twenty dollars per kilowatt if you have a lot of heat to uh, dissipate. Now, to be clear. Um, the uh, the allowable uh, maximum temperature of the stack is really low at 70 degrees, and you need to get rid of 10 kilowatts thermal. So if this is not going to be a regular car radiator. This is actually going to be significantly larger than um, than an internal combustion engine radiator. Um, so I would go I would go higher than 20 dollars per kilowatt. Um, so twenty dollars per kilowatt would be three hundred bucks. I would say you need about five hundred bucks worth of cooling, just from a cost perspective alone. And to be clear, I've worked with theoretical costs. It is it is very hard to scale this, uh, to scale a hydrogen fuel cell system so small as to be an extender. Uh, Fourteen thousand one hundred dollars is a humongous amount of money. And like, even if you scale it up, if uh, all you do is add more tanks to increase the capacity, for instance, to five or seven kilograms, those tanks, this is still a theoretical price, right? Two grand for a two kilogram hydrogen tank is a steal right now. I think it's gonna be cheaper in the long run to actually just, if you want to make, um, if you want to make hydrogen fuel cell range extenders, like buy secondhand Mirais from California uh, they go for less than fifteen thousand dollars. You get a complete car. Everything is already in it. Just transplant some stuff, and you'll get a much cheaper range extender than trying to buy it, build it yourself. I've talked about the theoretical cost of things, and uh, really, this is the, the probably the most important part of the video. If you're seriously considering making something like this or making a hydrogen system at all. Um, and that is uh, the fact that 
basically there is no real open market for these parts. So you can get batteries, you can get uh, these enclosures made. There are many companies that do this. There is, there is a genuine open market for this. For hydrogen fuel cells, there basically isn't. Uh, there's only one Google result uh, where you can actually buy anything and it is slightly disheartening. So basically the best, uh, the best price you can get is here a uh, six kilowatt um, fuel cell for $27,062. That is oddly specific. Uh, pretty decent, it, uh, it goes up to 110 volts, but uh, only 13 kilograms uh, altogether. Oh, system weight 16.4. I suppose they do add a controller and balancer and all that kind of stuff. So you would need two and a half of these uh, to make a viable range extender solution for a car. Uh, and at that point, it also starts becoming quite heavy and bulky. All right, so the, the place to be, of course, the, the only actual marketplace uh, for this kind of stuff is going to be Alibaba, it's going to be China. Um, and uh, there, there is like a decent amount of sort of hydrogen uh, system. Something like this is, uh, let me see, uh, 300 watts. How much does it have? It's only 150 bar. Yeah, okay, this is, this is not actually really serious system though there's uh there's a bunch of oh here here you go this is the one we saw <laughs> they just buy it in china uh for 20 grand and then they resell it for 26. that's that's sneaky that is sneaky um oh my goodness that is just overpriced um uh, yeah i mean you can get hydrogen stuff from china but still it's not going to be cheap. It's not going to be anywhere near uh, the prices I've shown. I was expecting lower prices, honestly. I've seen lower prices. I've seen, I've seen stuff for sub two thousand dollars per kilowatt. Yeah. So the the fuel cells themselves, um, you're going to be super lucky if you find anything even remotely close to the prices I've shown. And then also, as far as specs go. Uh, this uh, NetStack uh, is, I think, the largest fuel cell producer in the Netherlands. Netherlands is actually decent internationally uh, at making fuel cells and doing the whole hydrogen thing. Uh, has been for like 20 years. Um, the the specs are sort of disappointing. So they have this uh, 6.8 kilowatt electrical. Uh, they don't actually. So that's. I think that's the peak. Yeah, that's the, that's the absolute peak power that it outputs. And efficiency goes down quite quite significantly uh, at that point as well. So really, uh, by the way, efficiency is in the in the forty percent range at for uh, at full power instead of. Um, uh, oh, I think they say it here as well. Yeah, it's something. Like, it's ten kilowatts thermal at full power, even though it's only six point eight kilowatts uh, electrical. Uh, so even though we sized our um, uh, our thermal rejection system at 10 kilowatts for a 15 kilowatt fuel cell, uh, in reality it's going to be worse. Uh, and that is like these NetStack ones, quite good. Like for PEM fuel cells, this is a competitive PEM fuel cell these days. It's also 27 kilograms. Uh, so again, if you want a 15 kilowatt type deal, that's going to be quite quite heavy for just a fuel cell. Uh, there's also quite a lot of water in the system, like the total weight, including all the subsystems, is going to be significantly higher. Um, and uh, there, there's some, some other stuff that is interesting to see. Uh, so humidification, 50% you know, rate of humidity, total box standard, it's at 62 degrees, totally box standard. And so the same goes uh, for these tanks. Uh, Generally speaking, there is again no open market for these composite tanks. So the tanks that are uh, really lightweight for the, uh, the that's uh, that have like a, a six to eight uh, percent mass ratio or even ten percent mass ratio of stored hydrogen. These tanks you will have to get custom made. Uh, there's yeah, there's just no market for them, so they're made to order uh, for your project. So you will have to get them custom made. That's going to be more expensive. 
than the figures I quoted. And uh, really, like, hydrogen is already distributed in these kinds of tanks, so you're probably going to find a way to fit a standard hydrogen tank into the car. Uh, that's interesting. They did that here. So they, they, they put the tank in the tunnel. Uh, that's something you would do. That is probably the best option. And this uh, might even be significantly cheaper as well, even though it's heavier. And so if we go back here, it should be blindingly obvious that this, this price for a fuel cell stack, we saw 20K for a six kilowatt one. This, this is gonna be $30,000 or more for your fuel cell stack. And to be, to be fair though, uh, I'm saying that that's just based on these prices that we've seen. I think if you buy like a hundred or a thousand, you're, you're gonna get about a thousand dollars per kilowatt. So I think $15,000 is doable uh, if you're in the business of making this. Uh, and so for the, for the tank as well, I'm, I'm very sorry, but this is going to be a $3,000 tank. DC to DC converter, I'm hesitant to change anything about this. So let's just let's just do uh, only do the things that we actually saw evidence for, and say that this is uh, uh, going to be a uh, twenty thousand dollar. Sorry, it's twenty three ish um, uh, fuel cell extender. And so let's go back to this, right? So you will see on our website that we are actually a sale price is about that. So we are, uh, we want about a 25% margin. And this margin, uh, this, is, this is just like the business end of things. This margin is just there to compensate for uh, people coming back with uh, with faults or issues or us just spending more time and also like your company needs to live we need to eat um, there's there's more than just the cost of goods there's also some labor and stuff uh, this is a fairly thin margin already so uh, we, we can live off a margin like this you'd have to do the same here um, you have to have at least that kind of margin. So, in a in a practical actual uh, system, uh, this is this is going to be a twenty seven and a half grand um, fuel cell system. It's also not going to be small. Uh, the tank, the tank alone, is about a hundred liters. And that tank is not shaped like the boot of your car. The, the tank is a tank shape. So it has to fit somewhere and it's going to be in the way. Uh, the fuel cell stack too. Uh, so we, we saw those uh, fuel cell stacks. Let me just real quick check if NetStack have something that's in this power range. Uh, that's about 36 liters. That's not bad. That's, that's great. That's going to be 36 liters. And I'm going to just round up and say that the entire thing uh, is about uh, 150 to 200 liters. Just because of the form factor of the tank, it's going to be in the way. So already we see that this system that can do the exact same as our, as our battery uh, is about one and a half to two times the size and is about at least two and a half times the sale price. Uh, to the end consumer. I would say it's basically three times the price. Yeah, that's not really good. Uh, and it's it gets worse because that battery, we can keep adding to it and we only have to add batteries to it to make it larger. Like the rest of the systems are basically a fixed cost. Uh, if we would scale, let's say we want a $27,500 battery we already have the 33 kilowatt hours for 99.90. So uh, minus 99.90. That is about about the midpoint of the battery price. 
So $17,500, that's an additional 100 kilowatt hours worth of batteries that we can fit in the budget. So we can have a 133 kilowatt hour extender battery product. Uh, of course, our margins are not going to be enough. So let's, uh, let's say 88 kilowatt hours. Let's just keep the same uh, margins. That by itself isn't an extender battery anymore. That's just the main, that's the whole vehicle. You can drive hundreds and hundreds of miles on 88 kilowatt hours. Uh, it's going to be larger. But it's not going to be significantly larger than this. It's, it's going to be about like 300 liters altogether. Uh, but that's 300 liters you could fit underneath the car instead of inside the car. So really you're just making a replacement battery for cheaper than a fuel cell extender. Now a fuel cell extender, I mean, you can increase the capacity as well. You can add another tank, that's $3,000. You can make it 30,000. And then it will still be a much smaller solution than your battery. You would have to add $6,000 worth of tanks to get the same capacity as your batteries. And even then, you can make those batteries bigger. You can easily fit uh, another 33 kilowatt hours in there. So we'd have to add $9,000 worth of tax to get parity again. So you see that this, this fuel cell system, it just doesn't scale very well. And that's just, I mean, that's just the reality of uh, fuel cell systems. Not just right now, it's been that way for decades. Fuel cells have already always been more expensive and batteries have always been cheaper and getting cheaper faster um, than fuel cells. So that's like, from a business perspective, and uh, from all I can say, this is just the reality. Uh, a fuel cell range extender is just never going to work. So I do have a longer form blog planned uh, to accompany this uh, at some at some later, later date. Uh, once I've that that done, I will link it in the description. Uh, that will go into the real nitty gritty of uh, hydrogen fuel cells and uh, how this is likely going to develop and all kinds of technical details of why things are better and worse in some ways and what kind of applications would actually work with uh, hydrogen and with fuel cells and that kind of stuff. So uh, watch out for that if you're really interested, if you've watched until this point. Uh, and otherwise, uh, there will be a more uh, battery-centric video soon.